Welcome back to Face the Nation. Several major cities in the U.S. are racing to reopen to full capacity this weekend. Stadiums, bars, and restaurants were packed with crowds. But health officials warn the pandemic is not yet over as variants loom and as portions of the country remain unvaccinated. CBS News senior national correspondent Mark Strassman has more in Atlanta. Let me get your temp first. In California, COVID is off to summer camp. At least that's the worry. Campers wear masks too young for the vaccine. It feels really good. It feels really scary. I mean, we've, you know, we've been through a lot of change. Anxiety lingers because America's vaccination drive has fizzled. Nationally, now at fewer than one million new shots a day, down two-thirds from the April peak. There are plenty of people um, across the country in every state that still haven't been vaccinated. That droop in demand, despite the Delta variant's worrisome surge. Now looking unlikely, President Biden's July 4th goal, 70% of American adults with at least one shot. 14 states have met it already, led by Vermont at 83 percent. Close, six other states and the District of Columbia. But 15 states languish under 55 percent. Okay, the first one is 45. Various states now turn to vaccine promotions. The District of Columbia is buying you a beer. Washington State is high on its promotion. Joints? for jabs and in Alabama come on over to Talladega Super Speedway the biggest baddest racetrack on the planet and take two laps in NASCAR country this promotion took the checkered flag right wrong fewer than 100 people showed up vaccine passports remain polarizing 15 states have banned them but rules for businesses vary in Wisconsin this children's museum requires proof of vaccination or wear a mask an angry state lawmaker leaned into this hot take on history. The Gestapo wants to see your papers, please. No business has a right to your medical information, and I stand by it. Under a new Texas law, businesses that require proof of vaccination can be denied state contracts. Still, Methodist Hospital in Houston suspended dozens of nurses after they refused to get vaccinated. A federal judge sided with the hospital this weekend. But for other businesses, the personnel challenge is hiring. Incentives include sign-on bonuses, higher pay, even college tuition. Another reason to take a job, necessity. 25 states say they're ending enhanced weekly unemployment benefits. Here in Georgia, Vice President Kamala Harris will drop in later this week to promote the vaccine. This state's vaccination rate is well below the national average, so low it has turned down millions of additional doses. John? Mark Strassman, thank you. CBS News senior foreign correspondent Elizabeth Palmer is in London with more on the continuing COVID crisis around the world. Good morning. With plenty of vaccine available, COVID is now in retreat in North America and also in Europe, but not so in the global south. And there is growing concern for Africa, where cases are on the rise in 14 countries. In Chad, in Central Africa, the very first vaccines have just been rolled out. Health officials are thanking their lucky stars that infection rates so far haven't skyrocketed. Not so in Uganda, which has just closed its schools in a hurry and declared a lockdown after cases there rose more than 100% in a week. Ghana's public health network is also trying to hold the line against the virus. In partnership with an American company, Zipline, it's pioneering a system to cold pack and fly vaccine by drone to remote villages. But the shocking truth is that to date, only 1% of sub-Saharan Africans have been immunized. The G7 countries this week pledged to donate a billion vaccine doses to poorer countries, and half of them would come from America. It's not enough, but it is a start, says the WHO's Africa director, Machidso Moeti. The U.S. President Biden's plan to purchase and donate half a billion Pfizer vaccines is a monumental step forward. So the tide is starting to turn. On the other side of the world, in South America, COVID is surging. Many of Peru's far-flung communities have neither vaccine nor ICUs. Peru's government revised its COVID data two weeks ago, 
and discovered it has the most deaths per capita in the world. In Paraguay, huge lines have formed at vaccination centers. The take up there may be driven in part by the health ministries deciding to publish on its website the name of every person who gets a shot. And once again, it's Brazil that leads in both numbers of COVID cases and deaths, though Rio de Janeiro has managed to vaccinate almost half of all adults in the city. And finally, travel between the UK and the United States. It remains complicated and expensive. Now, the governments have set up a task force, but that probably means no streamlined rules anytime soon. John? Liz Palmer, thank you, Liz. We go now to Andy Slavitt, who most recently served as President Biden's senior advisor for COVID response. He joins us from Minneapolis to discuss his new book, Preventable. The inside story of how leadership failures, politics, and selfishness doomed the U.S. coronavirus response. Good morning. Morning, John. Let's start with the biggest preventable mistake. What was it? Well, John, I think it's easy to see some of the technical mistakes we made as a country, uh, and uh, you know, not, not with the CDC not having enough tests and not enough face masks and so forth. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that, that we made some political mistakes. And while this isn't primarily a political book, um, a culture of denying science, uh, denying the, the very virus and, and sowing divisions wasn't helpful. But I would argue that perhaps the thing we have to be most concerned about and most focused on are the are, are what role we all played. Um, you know, this was a uh, incredibly difficult period of time. But when we look at one another, um, the question is, did we do enough? Did we sacrifice even a little bit uh, for the health and for the business and for the for, for others? You know, we are we are a generation that has not sacrificed in long, long time in this country. And I think, you know, we all have to acknowledge that despite everything else, the technical and the, the political, we all played a role in this too. Do you think that the uh, shifting nature, which is the nature of public health information, you don't have perfect information, that that contributed to what you're talking about in terms of the public response, which is the, the public heard certain advice at the beginning, let's say about masks, and then that changed. Experts will say, well, that's the very nature of information. It changes. What many in the public heard was, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Well, there's a question of why was our tolerance for that so low? I mean, the problem is you, you have to believe in, in science when there are things that are going on you can't see with your naked eye. And this virus had a lot of properties spreading asymptomatically. So you didn't know you were carrying it or spreading it, spreading exponentially. So you didn't know, you couldn't picture how fast it was growing. That really required you to, to listen to scientists and understand uh, the scientific process. We as a country, I think, had a tough time with this. I think certain, certain uh, people were, were, were embracing it and following it along, but other people just, I think, kind of cynically exploited the divisions so that if, if a scientist changed their mind, it was an opportunity to say, see, they don't know what they're talking about, but I do. Or they don't know what they're talking about, so we don't need to listen to them. And, you know, I think that may have been a unique experience in our country where that was exploited a little bit more than, than just the sort of the natural confusion that occurs in the kind of fog of war. So uh, fog of war is the perfect expression to use. So we need to have the habits of mind for the next one of these that we face, as we surely will, the habits of mind to allow for the fog of war, which is people who are working hard but just make natural mistakes, but then also still have enough confidence to listen to what they're saying so that we do the right thing. Well, there's no question about it. And there's other decisions, you know, that we made that I don't even know we were conscious of making. You know, we classified roughly half the population as essential workers. Now, essential workers that are, that are taking care of us when we get sick, you know, we can understand that. But we had gobs and gobs of people who were, who were exposing to illness. There's a chapter in the book called, uh, called The Room Service Pandemic where there are, quite frankly, a number of people who did quite well during the pandemic, were quite comfortable, and were at home getting deliveries, and I count myself among them. But there were other people who were growing food, growing our crops, who were delivering those crops, who were, who were working in meatpacking plants, working in grocery stores, every day had to go to work. And we, and we knowingly and willingly exposed a lot of people while a lot of other people were comfortable. These are some deep, more deep embedded things about us and about our society. In the, 
the book tries to tell the story of how that um, how those decisions made without thinking about a pandemic really came back to haunt us. We've talked a lot about uh, American culture, the roles that experts play, Americans play, but let's now talk about the Trump administration. Give me your assessment of what's the most important thing to recognize about the Trump administration's handling of this. So well, we would have had uh, we would have had a, a pandemic without the Trump administration. The, but there were three, I think, I think deadly sins that the Trump administration made that played out. Um, the, the first was his power that he believed to deny the very existence of the virus or the potency of it, and to get his followers to go along with it. Uh, you know, if he if he simply hadn't done that and simply said, "Hey, we've got a problem," uh, we, we would have been in a very different situation. You know, the, the second was his 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 quashing of dissent. Um, as, as, as I laid out in the book that comes out um, early in this pandemic, in February, they sent out orders to the Department of Health and Human Services for 45 days. They were not even allowed to talk to the press, simply because Alex Azar wanted to say the expression that things were going fine but could change rapidly. They were, they really, they, and, and that, whether it was that or Nancy Messonnier or Tony Fauci, anybody that disagreed with the narrative the president wanted was, was squashed. And then the third was, was I think, um, really almost extra credit uh, was taking uh, the divisions in the country and playing playing into them. Uh, and I think this sort of the populist nature, being a populist during a pandemic is really not a great combination because you're going to have to make some tough decisions. You're going to have to make people unhappy. And I think Trump saw in his base a stirring of anti-mask um, characterizations and other things. And he played into those things because I think he felt like a different route. And I think those three things um, were things that were, were you know, cost us a lot of lives. In the last 20, 20 seconds here, uh, the Wuhan lab leak, if the United States had, had just assumed it had come out of a lab, would there have been any way in which the response would have been different to the actual virus? You know, I'm not sure about that. I don't think that, I don't think so. Look, I think we should be, first of all, nobody knows um, what's happened yet? We need this investigated. We need to. We need China to be forthcoming, and we need to be very forceful about it. But to this point, nobody really knows um, what happened. There are, are cases to be made on both sides. I agree with Dr. Gottlieb um, in his perspective that you've got uh, you've got characterizations that could go either way. An interesting anecdote in the book where this was all explained to President Trump through a bedtime story. So uh, that may be a part of the book that. Which kind of reflects on he was thinking about this. And we're going to have to leave it there. Andy Slavitt, thanks so much for being with us. The book is preventable. And we'll be right back. And we turn to former FDA commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's also on the board of Pfizer and has a new book coming out called Uncontrolled Spread, Why COVID-19 Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic. He joins us from Westport, Connecticut. Good morning, Dr. Gottlieb. Morning. Let's start with the Delta variant. As Elizabeth Palmer mentioned in her report, it's causing a lot of problems in the United Kingdom. The government is considering delaying the reopening for a month. The variant started in India, but now it's spreading across the world. What should we think about that in, in the United States? Look, and it's going to continue to spread. It's concerning. It appears to be more transmissible. There was data out from Neil Ferguson this week showing it's about 60 percent more transmissible than 117, which was that old U.K. variant that they're now calling the Alpha variant. So this is more contagious. Um, it appears that people who get this virus have higher viral loads, and they have those viral loads for longer periods of time, so they shed more virus. Right now in the United States, it's about 10 percent of infections. It's doubling every two weeks. So it's probably going to become the dominant strain here in the United States. That doesn't mean that we're going to see a sharp uptick in infections, but it does mean that this is going to take over. And I think the risk is really to the fall that this could spike a new epidemic heading into the fall. The vaccines seem to be effective. The mRNA vaccine seems to, seems to be highly effective. Two doses of that vaccine against this variant. The viral vector vaccines from J&J &J and AstraZeneca also appear to be effective, about 60 percent effective. The mRNA vaccines are about 88 percent effective. So we have the tools to control this and defeat it. We just need to use those tools. I think in parts of the country where you have less vaccination, particularly in parts of the South, where you have some cities where vaccination rates are low, there's a risk that you could see outbreaks with this new variant. The outbreaks that are happening in the U.K. are happening around schools where you have a lot of unvaccinated children. And is the, the CDC director last week urged parents to vaccinate their teens, citing a rise in hospitalization among 20, uh, 12 to 17-year-olds. 
is this variant causing that or? Probably not yet. I mean, I don't think that there's enough for this variant. We certainly haven't seen outbreaks with this variant in school-like settings here in the United States yet. Um, probably what's driving some of the increased infection among kids is 117. It's, it's also a more contagious variant, so it's getting into settings and infecting people who might not have been as vulnerable to the old wild-type variant that came out of Wuhan. So you're seeing a higher rate of infection among kids. And, and hopefully, you know, we're going to get more kids vaccinated. The vaccines are available right now for kids 12 and above. Hopefully, there's going to be a vaccine available for kids who are younger heading into the fall. Pfizer recently started a clinical trial with a vaccine for a younger age population. Moderna is developing a vaccine for that age cohort as well. We've talked about the Alpha variant, the Delta variant. The world is still uh, struggling with COVID. Should we expect over the next several months to talk about more variants based on the pattern we've seen so far? Yeah, it's really unclear. There's a lot of people who think that this virus has mutated rapidly over a short period of time and reached what we would call new fitness level, but it's not going to continue to mutate at this rate. It's mutating about at the rate of influenza B right now. So it's mutating as quickly as influenza B. Remember, this virus has to thread a very careful needle. It's trying to change the spike protein, which is a protein on a surface that we develop our antibodies against, in a way that our antibodies no longer recognize that protein. But that spike protein is also what the virus uses to attach to the lining of our respiratory tract. So so it can't change it too much or else it no longer can latch on to our cells. So, it, cells. so it's trying to thread a very careful needle. It may be that the rate of mutation of this virus starts to slow down. The good news is that so far none of these variants that we've seen defeat the vaccine. Some of them for some of them, the vaccines are a little less effective, but the vaccines have maintained their effectiveness against all of these variants, including 617. So I'm, I don't think we're going to see a situation where we're going to wake up one day like we sometimes see with influenza, where all of a sudden our vaccine doesn't work, at least not in the foreseeable future. Let me ask you about a, uh, the CDC is looking into cases of pericarditis, I think it's called. Um, is that something that people should be nervous about? I think it's something that the CDC and the FDA should be looking carefully at. I don't think people should be nervous about it right now. I don't think it changes the risk-benefit balance for this vaccine. Right now, these cases are clustered in uh, people 18 to 24, men more than women, about 80 percent of the cases that we've seen of men. There's been about 12 million people vaccinated between the age of 18 and 24. We've found 275 cases. It's not clear that there's a causal relationship between the vaccine and these cases. If there is, it's probably an inflammatory response from the vaccine. We know the vaccine creates an inflammatory response. A lot of these cases have happened immediately after vaccination. The vast majority have been self limiting They've been treated with steroids or NSAIDs in certain cases. Patients haven't gotten really sick. And we also have to keep in mind that people, especially young people, are going out more. And we're seeing more outbreaks of ordinary viruses. There's actually been a spike in respiratory syncytial virus, enterovirus, echoviruses, Coxsackie viruses. So it could be the case that as young people get vaccinated, they're going out more. They're exchanging other viruses. We're seeing outbreaks of those viruses, and we know those viruses also cause pericarditis. So it's not clear that it's the vaccine or perhaps a change in behavior, but it's certainly something we should be looking closely at because we have to properly inform patients if, in fact, this is a risk. So with 30 seconds left, if somebody's worried about their newly vaccinated younger person, what symptoms should they look out for if, uh, if they're concerned about pericarditis? So most of the cases where we've seen pericarditis and we believe it could be in association with the vaccine have happened immediately uh, after vaccination within probably the first two or three days, mostly after the second dose. The signs and symptoms of pericarditis typically are a stabbing or a sharp chest pain that's persistent. It's positional, so it hurts more when you lay back. Sometimes it hurts right. when you take Doctor. a deep breath because the pericardium, the lining of the heart rubs against the chest wall, and it might be associated with a fever. Okay, Dr. Gottlieb, thank you. We're out of time. We appreciate it. We'll be back in a moment. A major political shakeup is underway in Israel as the Knesset votes on a new government. Once confirmed, the unlikely alliance of right-wing, left-wing, centrist, and Islamist parties will remove Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu from power after 12 years. CBS News senior foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett is in Jerusalem. Good morning, Charlie. What's the latest? 
Uh, John, it has been an afternoon of high drama here at the Knesset. A lot of arguing, a lot of interruptions during these speeches, and it didn't really sound like a farewell speech from Benjamin Netanyahu, although the end is near. Uh, he really tore into this new government, uh, criticizing him, for example, saying they wouldn't have the strength to stand up against the Biden administration in terms of perhaps the resumption of talks with Iran over its nuclear program. And his final message, we will be back. Now, the incoming prime minister, Naftali Bennett, he thanked Netanyahu for his service. He also thanked the United States and the Biden administration for being a continued friend to Israel. That final vote is now just moments away in all likelihood, barring some miracle. It will be the end of Benjamin Netanyahu's career, at least for now. At, le at least for now, Charlie. And that's what I want to ask you about. How, how did we get to this point with Netanyahu in the last... There have been four elections in two years, but this finally he's out. Well, you know, the four elections in the past couple of years didn't help. There's been a lot of political volatility here, and people want to see some sort of resolution. It also didn't help that Netanyahu is in the middle of several corruption cases. So I think there was a sense on, on the opposition side that there was a weakness, that he was vulnerable. There's been tremendous outpouring of opposition, public opposition to Netanyahu. So that's when Neftali Bennett decided to jump sides, ideologically speaking, and become part of this uh, coalition party. It is a broad coalition from the far left to the far right and includes an Arab Islamist party for the first time. So just keeping that party together will be something of a miracle. Uh, Naftali Bennett will be the first prime minister. If they survive for the first two years, it will then uh, be handed over. Uh, but yes, the, the, in terms of whether this is the end of Benjamin Netanyahu, he remains the leader of the largest political party here at the Knesset, just not enough to garner enough support against the opposition. It is razor thin. We are talking about one seat that divides them. Well, high drama indeed. Charlie Daggett uh, in Jerusalem. Thanks so much, Charlie. And we'll be right back. We want to remind viewers, CBS News will carry live special coverage of President Biden's summit in Geneva with Russian President Vladimir Putin this Wednesday, June 16th. And that's it for Face the Nation. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm John Dickerson. We'll see you next week.